judge a nation, he shows certain signs. One of the signs that God shows when a nation is under judgment is by the leader. When a corrupt leader is elected into office, it's a sign from God that that nation is under judgment. And that is why the church should be very observant and discerning if you are a Christian. And you have to understand the different shakings and the different reorganizations in God's universe, especially in the political scene. God is not a socialist, neither is he a leftist or, or a rightist. Is not of the far left or the far right. Actually, man have their systems of government. It's not the system itself, most of the times, which is wrong. But every system can be used as a weapon for evil. So it is the people behind the system. And what has transpired in US election is a sign to the church and also to that nation that judgment is soon coming. And that is why the world too should be careful. The world should to be careful. The Bible says that God is the God of generations. When you read Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4, God says, who have brought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. So God says that I am the first and I am with the last. I called forth the generations from the beginning. So man lives in time. But all the generations in God's history, he called it for. He knows all the generations, he called it for. And that is why as Christians, Christians also should be careful to understand the mind of God concerning his chronological event as to do with his plan of salvation. Because from the foundation of this world, God plan the generations. He plan the times. He plan the times. So when you study the Bible, every time the Bible will tell you that God promised and in due time he fulfilled it. So for instance, when we go to Galatians, when we go to the book of Galatians, where Paul talks about the cross, Galatians chapter 4, is now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, different nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So there was a time appointed. God is taught dealing with appointed times. God deals with appointed times. Says even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time, so he talks about a due time, the researchers we call the fullness of time, God has his appointed times. And these appointed times, he put them in order. He put them there, he wrote them there, he spoke them into being from the foundation of the world. So when 
the time comes, there's just the fulfillment of God's plan. And that's what Isaiah is saying, that he called for the generations from the beginning. So God even knew the generation of Noah, he knew the generation of the law, the generation of the cross, the dispensation of the church, and also the millennial generation. He knows all these generations, and he planned it and called it forth. So sometimes there are people in this world who think that they are in charge. No, God is in charge. You, by you living in sin, you may delay God's plan and purpose for your life, but you cannot delay God's plan, His redemption plan. That redemption plan will continue and it will be fulfilled. So when you read the Bible, these Israelites, God brought them out of Exodus. He brought them through the Exodus out of Egypt. And when he brought them out of Egypt, the, the Bible says that they were in the wilderness for 40 years. After the 40 years, Joshua led them into the land of Canaan, the promised land. In the land of Canaan, when they went to the land of Canaan initially, the Bible says that through Joshua, God defeated seven nations and parted the land to these Israelites. After he parted the land to these Israelites, the Bible says that when Joshua came into old age and was about to die, they asked him, so who God will lead us to defeat these Canaanites? And God said that Judah will lead you. So Judah also led them. But the Bible helps us to know that any time, God has a plan for them, but any time that this Israelite went into disobedience, they came out of God's plan. Any time they've gone out of fellowship, God's redemption plan through the Israelites didn't continue. That plan didn't continue until they repented and came back. That's the same way for every Christian. When you are a Christian and you are in fellowship with God, you will be fulfilling God's plan for your life. Anytime you come out of fellowship, that plan ceases. And then it will take on from where you left off. Where you left off before you entered into that sin, into that waywardness. So it's not just up to God, it's also up to every human being and every Christian. And that is why Paul told the efficient Christians, another Christian says, redeem the time. Redeem the time. For some Christians, they think they have lived for 30 years. Now when you become a Christian, a new creature, God wipes everything. All the sins you committed as the old man, he wipes all the sins. He gives you a new slate. So you become a new creature. That is why Paul says that all things are passed away. All things become new. They become new in nature and in quality. And when you start living that life, and you sin for 10 years, to God, all those 10 years, he doesn't mention it to you. He doesn't even count it. He doesn't reckon it to you. At the end of time, when Jesus comes and you meet Jesus, if you live in your 40 years of Christianity, you were faithful to him for 20 years, all what God knows about you is the 20 years. Why? Because it's that 20 years that you could redeem. That is all, the only, the time span that he comes for you. So some, you ask some Christians, in their actual time, they will say, I have lived for 40 years, but on God's calendar, on God's timeline, that person probably may have lived for 10 years. This is why it's important that as Christians, you may be watching from online, you take the word of God seriously. You take the word of God seriously. Because like Jesus said, he says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. God's word will never pass. Sometimes when God sends out to speak his words, it comes like stories to some people. God's words may come to you as stories, but the day that 
the Lord is saying, you will know that it was reality. Everything that he says, first he came as the love of man. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So he came as a lamb. In the second coming, he's not coming as a lamb. He is coming as the lion. He is coming with vengeance. He is not coming the same way because there are many signs of God. And Paul calls it the terror of God. The researchers we call the terror of God. He, he knows that side of him. And that is why he's very patient. Like Peter will say that God is not slack on sending his promises, but is just long suffering. Why? Because he knows that when he shifts to the other gear, he shifts to the other position. Man, if you are not on the safe side, can you face the wrath of God? The Bible calls it the wrath of the Lamb. And that is why all oh, what this message of revelation that is about is not us just knowing scriptures and all these things, but God wrote through John, wrote this book to the church for this purpose. He wrote it to the church for this purpose so that he says, come out of them. You are not supposed to be judged with Babylon. So he says, come out of them. But for you to think that I am a Christian, if I walk in fornication, I will end up in the kingdom. You are joking. You are lying to yourself. Any preacher who comes and teaches you such messages, they are not sent by God. Any person who is sent by God speaks God's message. That is how you measure it. You will speak God's message to you. So any preacher anywhere who teach you that because Jesus has paid for your sins, you can wallow in sins and at the end you make it to the kingdom, that person is just deceiving you. Paul says that in the last days, dangerous, perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. And he says that Christians, because of the lust of their flesh, they shall draw to them teachers, who, false teachers, who teach them things that they want to hear. But really, it's not true. Really, it's not true. Now, what is all this about? What is God's creation and everything that he did about? It's just about God's plan of redemption. But in that plan of redemption, he revealed, progressively, he reveals himself to man. So all what creation is about is God revealing himself, revealing himself to mankind. He reveals himself to mankind. So first, he started, he wanted to start with a man called Adam and that man failed him. He tried to use another man called Noah, but he couldn't just get there. Then he found a man called Abraham who he could make a pact and a covenant with. And through this man Abraham, he brought forth his plan of redemption. But in all this plan of redemption, God was revealing himself. Through the law, he wanted to reveal himself through the law. But he couldn't because, not that the law wasn't good and perfect, but because the people that he was dealing with were hard-hearted. The Bible says that they had a stony heart. So then he could only reveal himself truly and fully in his son called the Christ. So Christ is the revelation of God. He is God being revealed in his fullness. And God, even before he got to Christ, dealing with the Israelites, he revealed himself in many ways. And that is why he brought forth many names. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, and Jehovah Sikenu. All these were revelations of God. One time he talked to Abraham. He says that most of the people before, they didn't know me by what? 
those people before knew me by other names like El Shaddai. For instance, Abraham knew God as El Shaddai. Because God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 and said that I am El Shaddai. When he came to Moses, he says, I am Jehovah. While he was revealing another side of him. So Abraham could only deal with God based on his revelation of God. He can only deal with God based on your revelation of God. And that's why also it's important. Knowledge is very important in Christianity. Sometimes there are these preachers who try to communicate to Christians that, oh, if you don't have any knowledge of God, if you don't have a revelation of truth, God is, is okay. God understands. God doesn't understand. That is not what God communicated in his way. God wants his children to be brought into full revelation of the truth. Because you can only walk with God or God can walk with you based on your revelation of him. And that is why God seeks to reveal himself to man. But God is the one who reveals himself to us. Without he revealing himself to us, we cannot know him. Because our mind cannot fathom God to he revealed himself to us. So God revealed himself throughout time as he revealed himself to mankind. And then came the Christ. And from the Christ, he also brought forth a body called the church. And that is why Paul writes to the church and says that now by you, to principalities, says that the manifold wisdom of God is revealed through you to principalities. This is the Another phase of God's revelation, but that's the fullness of his revelation through his son called Jesus Christ. But then he says that it is his wish, it is his will and desire that every one of us, every Christian, you watching us from online, is God's wish for you and desire for you. This is what gives God great satisfaction that you grow up to be like a son in all things. He didn't say in some things, in all things. So that is the Christian journey. That is the Christian journey. And in trying to do that, that is all what is enwrapped in the plan of redemption. Why redemption from what or redemption to be what? When God created Adam in the Garden of Eden, he said that let us create man in our image and likeness. That was God's purpose for creating man. Man was to be the glory of God. Man was to be the image and likeness of God. Meaning that man was to look like God and man was to function like God. But because of the fall, things changed. Things changed. But the fact that things change doesn't mean that it will end there because God cannot be defeated. God's plan and purpose ought to come to pass. But when God said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness, really he was pointing to the new creature. He was pointing to the new creature because like the Bible says that he knows all the generations. He, he called for all the generations from the beginning. And scripture helps us to know that the church is a chosen generation. The church is a chosen generation. So when he talked about even Adam, he knew the generation of the church from the get-go, from the beginning. And it was the generation of the church that was his most interest. That was what he was most interested in. But he knew he ought to start from somewhere. He ought to start from somewhere. So what did Christ come to do? Christ came to make that purpose of creation possible. That now that you are a Christian, you are not the true image and likeness of God. That is what righteousness is about. Righteousness is not just about, I have believed in Christ, I'm righteous, and I go on sinning and living in you anyhow. That is not what righteousness is about. Please, let's go to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. When you read 
read Proverbs chapter 30 from verse 11 to 12. The Bible says, There is a generation, there is a generation that cursed their father and do not bless their mother. There is a generation that cursed their father and do not bless their mother. Then he goes on to say, There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is another generation, they are pure in their own eyes. They have their own standard for measuring righteousness. They do not use God's standard for measuring righteousness. God says there is such a generation. When you talk to them, it's about their standards. Oh, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. So they have set their own standards. So you go to certain churches, when someone is in sin, wallowing in sin, but the pastor knows about it, the leaders, they know about it, but they will not talk and rebuke and correct such a person. God says there is such a generation. He says they are pure, righteous in their own eyes, yet they are not washed from their filthiness. The Christian is supposed to have been washed from his filthiness, but there are some who are not living that life granted them in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on and says that there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is such as a proud generation. And says there is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy from among them. The horse leash have two daughters, crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things, say not, it is enough. So God helps us to understand that there are different generations of men. There are different generations of men. They are disobedient generations, generations who will not live by God's standard. They have set their own standard and they think that when Jesus comes, is going to judge and measure them by their own standard. No, when he comes, he's going to judge each and every one of us. Like he says, he says, I'm coming to give to every man according to his works. When you just read something in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians, Paul writes, this epistle to Christians who are already born again. They are Christians. Then it, from the verse 23, it says, Colossians chapter 3 from verse 23. It says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. Why? He says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. So there is an inheritance. There is a reward. There is an inheritance. So knowing that the Lord of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. Then he goes on to say, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. For he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons when it comes to God. There is no respect of persons when it comes to God. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 11, Paul says, for other foundation can no man lay, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious to who hay stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. It's every man, he didn't say that only those in the world, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. 
and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So God is after a certain quality of work. God is not the God who some people like they think he compromise on his standards. But there are some Christians who think that, oh, let me just give anything to God with something that I think is appealing. Let me just present it and offer it to God, and this God will accept it. Now, you're a Christian, you are in church, you are a Christian, you go to church. If you live anyhow without understanding what God requires of you, you think that God is just going to accept something because you presented it. No, that's not how God is. And that is why he sent his servant to teach his children the way so that you, you know what he wants. But there are certain Christians who are deceiving themselves. It doesn't mean that such people will not end up in heaven. They will end up in the kingdom. They will end up in the kingdom, but they will what? They will lose. They will lose, and they will lose voluminously. They will lose. The, what they will lose, the, what they will lose it's not something that can be quantified. It says, if any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So it's only when that work abide, that is when you are going to receive a reward, as far as God is concerned. Then he goes on to say, if any man's work shall be bent, he shall suffer loss. Now, if you are suffering loss from God, how great will be that loss? Now, love is speaking. Love says that if any Christian, your work is bent, you shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yes, so as by fire. So you can be a Christian, you live anyhow, because sometimes when you are teaching and, and correcting Christians, there are some Christians who will tell you that, oh, I know what you are saying is true, but I will change, and you will be playing and joking about it. Because in their mind, they know that this God, who is a great God, is so compassionate, and then if you confess your sins, he'll forgive you. Yes, all those things are in Christ. You can sin, 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 and live waywardly. At the end, if you repent genuinely, he'll forgive you. But what he's telling you is that, though you will be saved, you will suffer loss. So the kingdom of God is not horizontal, it's vertical. And that is why Jesus talked about it. Jesus said that in that kingdom, there is a great in the kingdom, and there is what there is a least in the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is not what it's not what it's not horizontal, it is vertical. But some Christians they have communicated certain messages which are wrong. When you go to certain churches, what they teach them is that oh, when Jesus Christ comes, there we are all saved, and they all go, and then there, there's equality in the kingdom. That's not what God is, is saying. You don't reign over any other person in the kingdom, but in the kingdom, he helps us to know that there are levels. Now, as a Christian, what you ask yourself is that these apostles, these disciples of Jesus, and not only of Jesus, but through the centuries of the church, there are people who were bent because of what? Their faith and testimony of the gospel. There are people, missionaries, who left nations and traveled around preaching the gospel. You think that if you stay home and you joke with certain things and then you end up in the same kingdom with them, it's going to be equal rewards. It's not going to be so. It's not going to be so. That's what God is saying. Say that if any man's work shall be bent, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yes, so as by fire. So he said that the salvation is sure, but you will suffer loss. You will suffer loss. And that is why when Paul finished everything, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. See, I am now ready. I am now ready. He said, I'm now ready to depart. See, I'm now ready to go. And he says that when Jesus appears, he comes back. He says that I will receive the crown of righteousness. Not only I, Paul says that, but all those also who love his appearing. So these things are important. You see, you can be a Christian and then you will be living in a certain way, righteous, so you are dedicating, you are passionate about the things of God, and people will be saying certain things about you. You see? And if you are not careful, you may think that, oh, why? Because there are 
You have to understand that there are Christians who are carnal. So they will say certain things which may make you think that you are a fool, you are behaving foolishly, you are not serious about the things of life. But know that anything that you do for God, when they when you meet him, there is a reward for that. And and so that, that is why this Paul the apostle was like that, because he knew what all these things was about. What all these things was about. Why would he write to the Philippians? See that I count all things, I've counted all things as dank that I may win Christ. Why did he live the way he was living? Because he knew the plan. He knew the plan. He knew the plan and his target was focused on one thing. So when we look, we can look at the scripture like in Philippians. Read Philippians chapter 10, sorry, chapter 3, from verse from verse 7. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 7. Sometimes a Christian you can be so much concerned about the things of this life. You are not happy because of the things of this life. If the things of this life is what is driving you, controlling you, there is a problem. And many Christians are like that. There is a problem. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. I counted lost for Christ. All those things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. It says, yeah, doubtless. And I count all things. Not some things. He says that I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord. So he said that because of Jesus and his plan and his purpose, Paul says, I count all things as dark, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dark, that I may win Christ, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. This is all what this man's life was about. This was all what interested him. Then he goes on to say, If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, as though I had already attained, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may pour at this time, he has planted, when he made this statement, he has planted so many churches, but let's observe his communication. You know, there are some Christians, when they get to a certain level, they think that it's okay. Instead of them to what? Always pursue greater heights and greater levels in the things of God. Paul, at this time, he has planted a lot of churches, won a lot of souls. But look at what the man is saying. He says, not, though, not as though I had already attained. The man says, not as though I had already attained. Either we are already perfect. But I follow after. If I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So the man says that he, he saw himself as someone who has been arrested, apprehended of Christ Jesus. No wonder he says that I'm a prisoner. I'm, I'm in the bonds of the gospel. That's how this man saw himself. Then he goes on to say, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now there are some Christians when they read this, they say, oh, this is only applies to Paul. Now let's go on and see what Paul says from here. He says, let us therefore, now after saying this about him, he goes on to say, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. 
So he's saying that what I'm saying doesn't apply only to me, it applies to every Christian. See, it applies to every Christian. Therefore, let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be the same minded, thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto thee, unto you. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. So it says that no matter where you have attained, don't be proud. You should not be proud, but which what? Focus on going further and further and higher and higher. So as a Christian, that is the vision you live by. You should not be comparing yourself to carnal Christians who are not focused on the things of God. You should not say that, oh, because I've done so much and this other Christian is not doing so much, that means I'm okay. No, Paul says, don't be like that. Where you have attained is good, but focus and drive will be driven to achieve more and more for God. He says, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have asked for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, look at what it goes on to say, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and I tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Say that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. And these things are in the church. We have people who come portray themselves as men of God, but it's about money. Nowadays, that's what is in the church. They come preaching messages so that they can draw Christians and get money from them. Because their focus is money. And that, that person may be, be a, a person really called by God. But because he loves money, now you will see that he has shifted in teaching things where he can get money. You find now men of God having tied to how they preach messages, tied to how, how uh, to be a millionaire, how to be a millionaire. Is that the message that they found Jesus teaching? Is that the message that Jesus was teaching? Is that the message that Paul was teaching, Peter was teaching? But that's what is going now in the church of God. And now they portray also and they tell them that you'll be raptured before the tribulation. Because they want to speak words that will make them happy. But their focus really is about money. But it says that whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. It says they mind earthly things. They mind earthly things. So said people, because they mind earthly things, they don't come and teach the truth to the Christians. Things which are earthly. But John says, love not the world. So every their communication now, the message, the title of your message are all worldliness. But Paul says that all these ones, they are enemies of the cross. It is for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our says our manner of life should be as in heaven. Then he goes again in Colossians chapter 3 from the beginning. Colossians chapter 3 from verse 1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. He tells the Christian now the things that you should what? Seek after. He says, Now that you have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, he tells you the Christian, and now that you are in the church, now that you are in body, Christ is your life. Everything about you is about the Christ life. And this Christ came walking on this earth. He showed you the kind of life he lived. When Jesus came, Everything 
belonged to him. But how did he live on earth? So when these false preachers are teaching you things which are not true, you ask yourself, how did Jesus live on earth? Everything in the book of the Gospel of John, he told once a time, upon a time, he told his disciples, he said that everything belongs to me. When you read John chapter 16, he says that everything that the Father has belongs to me. So he knew who he was, that everything belonged to him. But how did he live on earth? He was after one thing. Or after one thing. After the kingdom business. The kingdom business. Says that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Now you may be watching me from online. Is this what your life is about? Is it about the kingdom or is it about the things of this world? What drives you in life? Is it the things of this world or the things of the kingdom? Because Jesus is coming very soon. Jesus is coming very soon. Now, as we are teaching Revelation, if you miss these things that I'm sharing with you, then we are, we are not making any ends meet. Because the purpose of this book of Revelation really is about these things. It's about these things. Bringing the church, the born servants, their mind. That's why we call them born servants. You are my born servant. John says that this is the revelation of God that he gave to Jesus to show to his born servants. So this is about the born servant. You are a born servant. It's not about your interest. You are here for a purpose. In as much as we are looking at all these mysteries, these different hidden revelations, if you miss the end, end game, the goal of this teaching, then you have not gone, you have not done anything. The end game is for you, the Christian, to change your life and pursue the things which are most important. And what are these things? These are the things, the reason for which he left us on this earth. If you are a Christian, don't deceive yourself thinking that you are here to go to school. You are not on this earth, planet earth, to go to school. You are not on this earth to do business. You are not on this earth to marry. You are not on this earth to have children. That is not why you are here. That is not why we are here. We are here for the kingdom business. That is why we are here. Please, let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. When we go to John chapter 17, the prayer that the master prayed for the church, and these are the very words of Jesus himself. And he's praying for the church. He's praying for his apostles, his disciples, and also the Christians. From the verse 18, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, Jesus said, I came not to do my work, but the will of him that sent me. I came not to do my work, but the will of him that sent me. Then he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. John chapter 17 from verse 8. He says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. So he said, In the same manner that you sent me into the world, it's for that same purpose that I have sent them into the world. So if you're a Christian and you are in this world, Jesus is telling you that. There is a purpose for which he has sent us into the world. There is a purpose, and that purpose, that same purpose for which his Father God sent him into the world. He says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Then he goes on to say, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also. They shall believe on me through their way. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them. So here, Jesus tells the church 
the purpose for which he sent us into the world. Since that the same purpose for which his father sent him into the world. It is for that same purpose. Now when he comes back again, like he said in Revelation chapter 22, that I'm coming. Please let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, we tell that I'm coming speedily, quickly. So I'm coming quickly and speedily. When he left, he gave us a work to do. He gave us a work to do. Then he says that I'm coming quickly to give every man according to what? His works. According to his works. So when you read Revelation chapter 22 from verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Now, this is another scripture which debunk their rapture before the tribulation. Because those who teach will be raptured before the tribulation, what they teach the Christians is that the revelations from the chapter 1 to the 3 is for the church. From the 4, you are not here anymore. Chapter 4, you have been raptured to heaven. And after chapter 4, everything applies to the Israelites. That is what they teach them. But hear the words of Jesus himself. Jesus is saying that, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things for the churches. So he's saying that all what John wrote, everything from the chapter 1 to 22, everything he revealed is for the churches. That is what Jesus is saying. He said, I, have, I Jesus, have sent. Jesus is speaking. So you better, as a Christian, listen to what Jesus is saying than what a preacher, another preacher is telling you. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you, John, these things in the churches. That is for the churches. So he says that the chapter 5, I wanted the church to hear. The chapter 6, I wanted them to hear. Revelation chapter 7, I wanted them to hear. The chapter 8, I wanted them to hear. When they, I said in the chapter 8, in come out of Babylon, I wanted them to hear. It wasn't for Israelites. He says that for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hear it say, Come, and let him that is attest, Come. Now look at what he says again. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. But they tell you that you, the bride, you are coming with Jesus. So these folks are teaching their mind to the church. They are teaching their mind to the church and they are leading them astray. It doesn't matter. The name, if that person, that minister has made a name globally, if he's teaching you that you raptured before the tribulation, he's lying to you. That, that communication of gospel is not from Jesus Christ. What they have been teaching, those ministers, because of the respect I have for them, I don't mention their names. But they should be careful because what they have been teaching, they are leading the church astray. They are leading the church astray. That is not what that is not what Jesus said. He says, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Which coming is he talking about? Which coming is he talking about? The final coming of the Lord Jesus. And he says that the bride is saying, come. The bride is saying, come. He's not coming with the bride. The bride say, come. He says, and the spirit and the bride. He says, only the spirit, the spirit and the bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Not that Jesus is coming with the bride. Like he have been teaching them. He says, and the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear it say, Come. And let him that is attest, Come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life free. He says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. And that's why such ministers should be careful how they have been teaching this book to the Christians. 
because this the one here he says that for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things God shall add unto him the place that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of this book look at what he says those who also take away from the words of this book when he says that I am coming, you will be here, and they go preaching that he is saying that there is no tribulation, there is no persecution, you will not be part of the great tribulation, you will not pass through that, that, that purification period. You are taken away from this book. Because that is not what he said. He said that, like Daniel says, he says that the, the, the saints become whiter and whiter, they will be purified. That is what he, he communicated. But when we go teaching people our minds, as a pastor, you, 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 you tell a whole, a whole mass of audience that they will be raptured before their tribulation. That is not what Jesus said. He said that the bride said, come. The bride is waiting for him. So the bride said, come, Lord Jesus, come. Not that the bride will be raptured and I'll be coming with the bride. And the bride is the church. He said, if any man shall take away from the words of the book, and it's because of these reasons that some of them who have found out that what they have been teaching is it's not coherent with some scriptures, then they will come back teaching the church that the church is not the bride. That Israel is the bride. Why? Because when you see such a scripture, the scripture says the bride is saying, come. So if the church then becomes the bride, then he knows that that teaching of pre-tribulation rapture is not true. So what should we do then? Then they have to find a way to tell you and communicate to them that now you are not the bride. It's only Israel who are the bride. But the Bible shows, as we read in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that the church is the bride. The church is the bride. The church together with the remnant of Israel, they are the bride. They are the bride. Now, when the Bible talks about the church, what does that refer to? Please, let's go to Acts chapter 7. Because these the Gentile Christians, now the word church, 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 when they hear it, they think that it is a preserved name for the Gentile Christians. So when they hear the word church, they are thinking about the, the Gentile Christians. But the church, that name was even first used for Jews. For Jews, let me go to Acts chapter 7, Stephen. So they teach things out of context, and many are following them, and they think that this is the mind and the revelation from God. No, it's not the mind, that is not a message from God, it's people teaching their minds, teaching their minds. Let me read Acts chapter 7. Please, you can take it from the verse 35. Acts chapter 7 from verse 35. So you are a Christian joining us from online and you may have been taught that you, the church, you will be raptured before the tribulation. And they, 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 they say a lot of certain things. For instance, in the book of Revelation, they will tell you that the church applies to the Gentiles. So he says that when the fullness of the Gentiles be coming, so then they think that the church is only about the Gentiles. So then to them, when the fullness of the Gentiles come, it means that the church has been is full now. So the church will be raptured. The church is not complete without the Jews. The church is not complete without the Jews. So, so it's things that they have come because now when the Christian hears the name church, it thinks that only applies to the Gentiles, the Gentile, the Gentile Christians. But look at what the Bible says here. It says this Moses, Stephen, it says this Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who may be a ruler and a judge? The same day God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. 
He brought them out. After that, he had shewed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So there yes, Stephen is saying that these Jewish nations, these Jews who were in the wilderness, they were the church. He called them the church in the wilderness. So Israel as, as a nation was referred to as the church in the wilderness. The church in the wilderness. So when the name, that, that term church is mentioned, Christians should understand that when the, it doesn't apply to only the Gentiles. Because now they say that, oh, the church age. The church age. No, but the, the Israelite nations also are referred to as the church in the wilderness. So without them, like Paul in Romans chapter 11 was communicating that mystery to the Gentiles. Now don't be proud. Don't be high-minded. Because without them, the church will not be full. The church will not be full. And that is why after the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, he turns attention also to the what? To the remnant of Israel. So that at the end, that church will be full. So for instance, when you, you, you look at Hebrews chapter 12, you read Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and he mentions of the new Jerusalem. He doesn't talk of Old Testament, he doesn't separate it. Let, please, let's read that, Hebrews chapter 12. Because they don't, they don't get it. These leaders who have been teaching them, they don't get it. Because they, 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 to their mind, it's church age, this age. So they, they think that the church is only the Gentiles. No. The first group of people to be called the church were the Jewish nations. They were the, 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 that name was used for the Jewish nations who were in the wilderness. Moses and those Jews who have come out of the Exodus, by the Exodus out of Egypt, they were referred to as the church. Those who came by the Exodus out of Egypt were referred to as the church. When you go to Hebrews chapter 12, now when he's talking about he's talking about New Jerusalem. From the verse 22. It says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just man made perfect. So here when you read, you don't see the nation of Israel being mentioned. He just talked about the church. Why to the general assembly and the church? Because the general assembly and the church applies to both the Gentiles and the remnant, the Gentile Christians and the remnant of Israel. Israel nation after the flesh. That applies to both of them. In God's mind, he knows that that's what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. And that is why he calls them the church. They are called the church in Acts chapter 7. They are referred to as a church. So when the Gentile Christians, now these denominations, they go on preaching that we will be raptured uh, uh, before the tribulation because we are the church and the church age finished and then we are raptured. They are not fully understood that the church is not really full. He talks about the fullness of the Gentile, that's the Gentile side of the church. So there's the Gentile side of the church. So we see that the fullness of that of that Gentile should come in. That is the Gentile side. But also there's the remnant of Israel side of the church. They too ought to come in. And that is why Paul will say that 
If through their casting away, salvation and reconciliation came to the, the Gentiles, say that through also our mercy, they will receive mercy. So this is God's plan. So when certain men of God comes preaching their own plan for the body of Christ, they are leaving, leading them astray. They are leading them astray. So you the Christian, what God wants you to understand is that, like he says, the bride say, come. The bride is, is, is crying unto the Lord. He says, I come. Why would the bride say, come? Because the bride will be on this earth for him to come. The bride will be on this earth. And he's talking about his final coming. When I'm coming, he says that the bride says, Lord Jesus, come. Not only the bride, says that everyone that hear it is also say, Lord Jesus, come. So the bride will be on this earth. And Jesus said, as we read, says that I sent John to testify these things for the church. So when he says for the church, to him it applies. To, that is why the whole book of Revelation talks about the remnant of Israel. It also talks about what? The Gentile Christians too. Why? Because to, as, as long as God is concerned, the church applies to both. Even these churches that he mentioned, to the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, in that, those churches there were Gentile Christians, also they were Jewish Christians. And to, together they were called church. They were called church. So that is how it is. The church does not only apply to Gentile Christians, it also includes the remnant of Israel. So when now you see that terminology being changed from church to saints, then you should not, you should not be, 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 uh, be deceived by that. To mean that, that now that saints applies to only the Old Testament, uh, sorry, the, the Jewish people. No, it applies to the same church. He's talking about the Christians. That he's talking about. So then it's very important that as Christians we understand these things. That God will never compromise on his standards. He will never compromise on his standards. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we be ending, because it's important that as we are looking at the book of Revelation, and we are now in chapter 21, we'll be finishing very soon. The main purpose of this book has to do with also be, 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 be talked about so that people will understand the essence of the book of Revelation. The essence of the book of Revelation is not just that we can know all these trumpets, seals, and there's for a purpose. Why? Because God loves his children so much. He doesn't want his children to be part of that. And he knows that he too is a righteous God. He gives to every man according to his ways. So he's not going to say that because you are, you are a Christian, if you are walking in sins, you will be part of his kingdom. But then because he loves his children, he comes to warn his children and tell the children, come out from among them. Come out from among them. Don't be like them. Come out. And in Korea, like Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, if you come out from among them, I will receive you unto myself. And you brought daughters and sons unto me. So Christianity, the Christian is a soldier. That's how you have to see yourself. A Christian, you are a soldier. You are a soldier on the run. That is how God sees you, and that's how you have to see yourself. Christianity is not for the weakling. It's, it's for soldiers. It's for soldiers. And all this time, that what he's doing is that he's preparing all this through this age. He's preparing the church, the Christians, He's preparing them for what is coming. He's preparing them. And Paul understood this. So when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, talking about his life, from verse 23, it says that, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiver the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. 
I, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So the man said that in this Christian life, I was doing it according to a plan. It's not that I was doing it anyhow. Like there are some Christians who think that well, let me do it anyhow and present anything to God. No. He says that I was focused also, it's not, it's not something I was doing anyhow. He says that not as one that beateth the air. He was focused, he knew the plan, and he was living on that plan. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Paul says, now there are some preachers who have been preaching when Paul was struggling with sin. But Paul says, no, it's not true. But I keep under my body, I brought my body in subjection. He said, I bring it into subjection. Let that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he said that even though you're a pastor or a preacher, if you are not careful, you too can be rejected. That's what the man is saying here. He says that even though I was sent to preach the gospel, I knew that I too have to live. It's not Christianity is not just about precept, but I have to be an example. I have to live that life. For if I don't do that, after I have preached to others, I myself will be rejected. So if you are if Christians think that Christianity, salvation in Christ means that. Now that you are born again, go and live anyhow, and at the end, you will be part of the kingdom. That is deception. That is Satan deceiving Christians. And why is it that God wants us to, to speak about this thing? Because this thing is going on in many circles of the church nowadays. It's going on because they have been preaching wrong messages to them that, oh, You'll be raptured, there won't be, be any tribulation for you, it's for people who are sending all kinds of, of, of stories which are not true. But what did John say about himself in the first chapter of Revelation? He, when you wrote that epistle to the, the Christian, he says that I am your companion in tribulation, in the kingdom and in the patience of God. He says, I am your companion in that. Was John and that foremost apostle John was he also sinning to be in, in tribulation. If at the time that he was writing this book, from the he received this revelation at the island of Patmos, he was there, he has been deported to that place out of what? Out of his witness and testimony for Jesus Christ. Was, as a result of tribulation and persecution. So even the man received this revelation in tribulations. And now people go on teaching certain things which are not true, that second, people who are first flight, second flight, and those who are second flight is because they are not living rightly. Is that what God says? Is that what the word of God says? And you, the Christian, you have to be careful because you cannot blame Jesus. He tells you in, through a servant Paul in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, prove all things. God says, prove all things. How do you prove it? You take your Bible. What? That man will come. Who may call himself a prophet, an evangelist. So when they come, what they say is not because the person used big, big terms. That doesn't mean that he understands what he's saying or what he's saying is true. But you have to take the Bible and look at the word and align it to it. Is he speaking? The mind of God. Is he speaking the mind of God? Is he speaking the mind of God? That is what is important. Jesus was all knowledgeable. He knew everything. But his communication was very simple. He communicated in a simple way. But at the end, that was what was important. So as Christians should not be moved because people come and they use baby time. It doesn't mean that they even really understand the truth of what they are preaching. Because people can talk like that, but they don't really even understand what they are saying. They don't understand what they are saying. And they're sad because what saddens my heart is that some of these people, the followers, they have a lot of people following them. Many Christians following them. And they are being led astray thinking that they will not be here. But we will be here. We will be here. We will be here because it's part of their plan. It's part of their plan for us to be here. And that is why he says, the bride says, come. 
So the bride will be here when the master is coming. And like John says, when he's coming, then the bride will be raptured and presented unto him. The same way a woman, when he's married, is being presented to the husband by his relatives. The angels will now, during the rapture, present the bride in the air to the Lord. Then after that, he comes down with the angels and the bride. That is how it's going to be done. So we will meet him when he's coming. It doesn't mean that we'll be coming from heaven with him. So we thank the Lord for today's message. That is important. What God wants you, the Christian, to understand from today's message is that the book of Revelation is for every Christian. From chapter 1 to chapter 22, everything there applies to the church. It applies to the Christian. And God wants us to understand the book of Revelation. And after understanding that, He wants you to prepare. Prepare. Like He said to the church, the Christian has said this. says that when I look down, when I look at you, only few names are worthy, are worthy to work with me. Only few names have not defined their garments and they are worthy. That, these are the very words of Jesus himself. He's, he's talking to a church. He looks at the church. He says, I look at you, but only few names are worthy to work with me. Only few names. The rest is told and repent. If you don't repent, I will blot you out from the book of life. So these are not things for us to do. Like the master himself says, is that narrow is the way that leads to what to the kingdom. So God bless you. You may be online and you are not living rightly. You may be a Christian, you are not living rightly. You make a change from today. Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You have to prepare. For his coming. So that like John says, when he comes, you will not be ashamed. Because there are Christians who are going to be ashamed when he comes. But you should not be one. So God bless you. And may everything that you do prosper this week. In Jesus' name. Amen.